Yo, this is Koski of Fundy. I'm back at it once again. Thinking it for you and for yours. First of all, I'd like to say thank you because the channel's been growing. They've been doing this thing, you know. So thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. You know, hitting the like buttons, what you do. And also, you know what I mean? Um, thank you to my ancestors because, man, A, it's waking up out there. You know what I'm saying? Our people is waking up. We doing it big. And I'm very humble and very proud to be, you know, but well, humble and proud to do is oxymoron. I'm very humble to be part of this movement. You know what I'm saying? That's popping off. You know, and uh, right here we all look at the, um, this one right here is the maroon and the slave communities of South Carolina before 1865. Now, many people don't know about the maroon communities. It was maroon communities all over the United States. We just didn't take slavery lying down. You know what I'm saying? You know, we ran away from many communities. Um, all throughout the southern part of the United States of America. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to get into this. Uh, this is from the, um, the South Carolina Society. So this is, like I said, is, is known as historically factual and everything. In the past several decades, revenging this to the long-standing concept of community, I played a significant role in enriching our understanding of the complexity of enslaved life in North America. Few historians suggest it any more than enslaved people was already bounded together by shared oppression and worked on topics as diverse as informal and informal economy, family life, courtship, and honor have effectively combined to refute the myth of the idiotic slave community that Peter Kirchner warned with our recent development of revisionist history. There have been a greater temporal focus on geotemporal on geographical differences in enslavement as well and spiritual distinctions that play in everyday life, methodology critiques, such as Anthony's case, have stressed the need to formulate dynamics and conclusion and exclusion through a more practical geographical specifics. In light of such scholarships, historians now emphasize the nuance, the flexibility, and the dynamic relationship at the heart of the multiple slave communities, continual influx and inhabited by real people. In the recently historic Summary, Jeff Fowett concluded that any romanticization of the slave community is rapidly drawing to a close. Much of the latest scholarly work concentrates instead of the, on the slave conflict, recently reminding us that in Dylan, Dylan's Henry Grove words, there is no reason to think that the black community in the 1800 was any more harmonious than the white community. In this body of literature that's presented articles, those to build on, particularly with regards to exploring If we regard to exploring the resistance and solidarity among the enslaved, historians have documented how overlapping communities and neighborhood distinctions complicate the politics of the slave solidarity. Indeed, it has been known that the very act of forming supportive communities could mean the exclusion of those deemed outsiders. Okay remarks remarking that the rental established that the runaways established principles of solidarity, most pointing in capturing run runaway strangers from the outside of the neighborhood. It was clear with the discussion of resistance and runaways, early revision with notions of the code of the group, whereby fugitives could simply rely and will support their fellow slaves, has been dismantled in favor of more detailed exploration of particular contents and personal considerations. While these encounters between slaves and the individual runaways have been used to provide evidence of distinctions or divisions within the black populace of North America, interactions between the slave communities and members of another distinctive type community, the Maroons, have received less attention. Maroon communities were formed by escaped slaves in the woods, swamps, and mountains throughout the southern United States. Although many runaway slaves left their plantation only for short periods of time and were either caught or returned voluntarily after a few weeks, some, all right, some had the skill and the will to form autonomous communities in the wilderness and had no intentions to return to slavery. These communities were organized comparatively free from white interference and offer us an opportunity to sow to see how African-Americans established themselves when they had a limited chance to do so. However, judging from the historiography, the rural communities are viewed less important in North America than in the Caribbean or Latin America. This is perhaps understandable when one considers the undeniable impact of maroon origin in these regions. And it's not our intention to claim that the practice was extensive 
in North America as it was in Jamaica, Thailand, or Brazil. Where these regions saw a creation of viable and enduring rural communities far from European settlements, at times containing thousands of runaways, the evidence suggests that the Maroonage in North America was on a far smaller scale. Nevertheless, numbers are not everything. To dismiss the Maroon communities and to resume and subsume them within a rubric of runaways may overlook their potential and further our knowledge and the tension between the overlapping communities of people and the politics of solidarity among the enslaved. Maroon communities could challenge the neighborhood distinctions, exposing conflicts, negotiations that cross the plantation boundaries. Furthermore, considering the relative strength and aggression of the Maroon communities in comparison to the individual smaller groups of runaways seeking flight, and those who remain in bondage will first negotiate and interact with them in different ways. This article concentrates on South Carolina because the evidence of Maroon activity is more abundant for this state than any other. This is not to say that Maroon communities were absent in other parts of the South. Maroons were active wherever and wherever slavery existed, especially in Virginia, North Carolina, and Alabama. Colonial slave populations were, of course, more African and less occultured than their 19th century descendants. Even so, Maroonage occurred among the oldest states along the eastern seaboard to the newest southwestern additions. As early as 1729, the governor of Virginia reported that a group of one race slaves had settled in the fastness of the neighboring mountains. He feared they would soon be ceased to cause an accession of runaway slaves and prove dangerous neighbors without to our frontier inhabitants. While the Appalachians were attractive in the 18th century due to their sparse European settlement, they did not retain their lure after the American Revolution as widespread inland. In fact, the largest single maroon community in North America was almost certainly formed in the great dismal swamp on the border between Virginia and North Carolina. This is the largest maroon community was in Virginia and North Carolina border. One of the visitors to the area in 1784 was told that runaway niggas had resigned in each place for 12, 20, 30 years and upwards, subsisting on themselves in the swamp upon corn, hogs, and fowl that they raised, and on some spots, not perpetual underwater, nor subject to the flood, as 49 parts of the 50 are. On such parts, they have erected inhabitants and clear small fields around them. Yet these has always been perfectly, perfectly impenetrable to any of the habits of the country around, even those nearest and best equipped with the swamps. Consequently, runaways in these horrible swamps are perfectly safe and with the greatest facility to elude the most diligent of their pursuers. The attraction of the dismal swamp for maroons, namely for its inaccessibility, also means we have few accounts of communities formed there, since literally literate whites rarely risk visiting in the dense interior. Far better documented are the maroons of South Carolina. Of all the colonies in the states that came later on the, north, on the mainland of North Carolina, of North America, excuse me, South Carolina was more closely replicated in the demiology of the Caribbean islands like Jamaica, Barbados, and Hispaniola. By 1708, enslaved Africans formed the majority of South Carolina's population, the only mainland colony in which this happened. And in the coastal parishes, dominated by rice plantations, up to 80% of the population was enslaved. The slave population of South Carolina was more African and became more creolized, slowly than other significant concentration of slaves in colonial North America and Virginia. Even in 1780, about a third or 100,000 of slaves living in South Carolina had been born in Africa. Given that South Carolina had a large enslaved population, many of whom had memories of freedom before enslavement, it was not surprising that a significant number ran away. Between 1732 and 1801, slaveholders advertised more than 2,000 fugitive slaves in South Carolina newspaper. So this was likely only a small fraction of those who actually ran away since advertising was expensive. And many masters hoped, not unreasonably, that the fugitive will return. When these slaves fled due to mistreatment, 
the desire to be back among family and friends on the plantation was usually strong. Plus, comparatively few slaves possessed the survival skills to remain terms for long. Most returned home voluntarily, cold and hungry, or were caught by special hunting parties of overseers and dogs. Runaways were predominantly young and male, and they had often been sold several times. Some during the colonial period struck off for freedom among the Indian tribes in the West or the Spanish in Florida. In the 19th century, they headed for the North. The immediate step was maroonage, remained hidden relatively, relatively locally on the place of enslavement, but with no intention of returning to slavery. These maroons usually found strength in numbers banding together, while other runaways built camps for themselves that afforded shelter and sometimes a communal planting ground. It should be noted that no contemporary South Carolina source used the term maroon to describe long-term fugitives. It is here to distinguish maroons from their short-term torrents. Even though both can be legitimately be termed runaways, there was no set definition as when a torrent evolved into a maroon, but being absent for a considerable time and length was a key criteria. The South Carolina, South Carolina legislature itself made a distinction between torrents who were absent less than three months and to those notorious runaways who shall be on run for 12 months. The latter, which run away and lied out of considerable space and time, in a length which becomes desperate and stands upon their affiance with knives, weapons, and arms, and could be pursued by any white person. And if any such runaway cannot be otherwise taken by lawful to kill such notorious offenders. Most Maroon communities existed for several years, but the Savannah River Maroons, Maroons who lived on the border between South Carolina and Georgia, came in prominence in 1786 and in 1787, had existed for at least since 1782, and could have adopted some of the older Maroon communities that resided in the same location as far back as 1765. The geography of the low country of South Carolina was essentially conducted to the formation of Maroon communities. Numerous of rivers, which is the Shanty, the Cooper, Ashley, the Isido, and Savannah were among the most notable. Slowly mentored their way towards the sea and were edged out by interlocking, large interlocking swamps. While rice cultivation tamed the tidal swamps adjacent to South Carolina major rivers in the 18th and 19th century, the plantation fronting the rivers normally backed up to extensive overgrown swamps. These back swamps were different from the rice swamps because despite being in low areas, marshy ground, the poor drainage of the back swamp rendered them useless for tidal swamps, tidal cultivation. To the planters, the back swamps dominated by large cypress and tubulo trees were little productive for use and consequently in Norris. This neglect left many spaces for the maroons to occupy and make of their own. Thus, while the plantation were absolutely obstructing in places of order and regiment, the back swamps remained Marco Jones, untamed by Europeans, densely covered cut forested, and full of danger fauna such as alligators and snakes. Since planters frequently owned large tracts of land and typically laid out plantations involved a big house close to the river and a settlement for the slaves, often some distance away. This arrangement placed the end slaves close to the swamp and gave them an opportunity to become familiar with the uninhabitable environment. As one historian notes, the woods and the swamps are liminal areas that the planters owned, but the slaves had mastered. It was too easy for contemporary maps to give the impression that white mastery extended over the entire landscape. But plenty of control of isolated back swamps were loose at best. Reference to the maroon activity in South Carolina started in the eight, early 8th century, 18th century and continued to the Civil War with the peace of imperial crisis in the, of the 1760s and the aftermath of the American Revolutionary War in the 1780s and during the 1810s and the 1820s. While the enslaved population of South Carolina did evolve during the 18th and the first half of the 19th century, some increasingly acculturated and less African, it seems to have a minimal impact on maroonage. There is little to suggest that the maroons in South Carolina were more than likely having been born in Africa than America or vice versa. 
Regardless, the Maroonies appear to have fared up on whites and were divided amongst themselves as they were over the Stamp Act or during the Revolution. While the enslaved attempted to seize upon the lapses of vigilantes brought about the unrest. Maroon groups were initially formed by runaway slaves who met either by accident or in design in a swamp moved to swamp, and was significantly remote to permit the creation of a separate settlement with a set of semi-permanent buildings. One maroon settlement in 1765 was a square consisting of four row houses, 17 feet long and 14 feet wide. Abundant supplies in the town were kettles, 15 bushels of rough rice blanket pots, pails, shoes, axes, and many other tools. Another camp was described in 1787 as being 700 yards in length, about 120 in width. It contained 21 houses, enough to accommodate 200 people, and with the whole land cleared, planted rice and potatoes. Who, in their bellies and root over their heads, were bite up for maroons to endure the survival and their success in securing the essentials as documented. A maroon camp found near Georgetown in 1824 consisted of a snug little habitations stocked with ducks, turkeys, vegetables, and beef, as well as primitive rice. A nearby camp two years later included a large quantity of beef, a fine fat cow, pots, clothing, a hog pen, wells dug, and necessary preparation for a long residence. Maroon communities stood a better chance, stood a better chance lasting if they had suffered, if they had sufficient people to help safeguard the settlement. And indeed, one of the distinct features of the Maroons was the tendency to band together as in a common cause. Ideally, Maroon communities needed people to attend crops and to attain supplies of food, utensils, and weapons to act like sentries and, if necessary, to fight. Groups of five to 10 individuals were less likely to thrive in a group of 20 or more. Estimated the size of Maroon communities in South Carolina range from a band or a gang up to 10 people, or a large gang, or large and great numbers, which perhaps mounted more than 100. With the report to Maroon being abundantly provided with delicacies as well as necessities, it's perhaps not surprising that their secret settlements acted some as a magnet for runaway slaves. New fugitive augmented numbers of Maroons, and ultimately, whites came to believe that one of the main threats posed upon Maroon groups was that they encouraged and attracted additional runaways. Maroon, by definition, had managed to become beyond white control for some time, and the planners felt that this success meant that others are encouraged to follow the same course and those at home become disorderly and subordinate. Planters in the Christ Church Parish, north of Charleston, described how a good escape for one runaway slave in 1822 had resulted in another one joining him in 1824. An additional five parents with three children joined the same gang leader in 1825. Maroon communities differ from other types of communities formed by Africans and African Americans in Charleston, South Carolina, and South Carolina, in a number of interesting ways. For one thing, they were, by necessity, far more concerned with security. Plantation slaves could not organize military style units nor were their villages protected by hidden paths, sentry, and earthworks. Maroons had these sentry security measures since they existed in a state of a permanent crisis due to the fear of military attack. It is noteworthy that the Maroons in Jamaica and Suriname employed similar defensive techniques, possibly suggesting a common African origin. Mm. Settlements were constructed far from navigable rivers, and land and finding them required long tracks across difficult terrain. One band of settlers in the pursuit of a group of maroons traveled at least four miles into the swamp, sometimes, some of the times through waist deep water, and all while exposing themselves to alligator attacks. Such conditions deterred all but almost a determinants were sewers, and even when the settlements were found, they could be well fortified. Surrounding one camp was a kind of a breach Work with four feet high constructed out of logs and cane that came to cut a clear ground, while a single narrow entrance would admit but one person to pass at a time. 150, 150 yards downstream, a sentry was posted. 
and about two miles below the camp, they had fallen logs across the creek in order to prevent boats from passing up. Small canoes might pass at high water. Another settlement was situated behind eleva a small elevation surrounded by extensive rear areas of marsh. By climbing a high tree on each of them and a complete view of the bay, the creek and surrounding island was presented to the spectator. While he could remain concealed by the foliage. Only well armed and highly drilled and highly disciplined troops could enter and launch an assault on a maroon settlement, especially when the defenders will most certainly have an advanced warning of the attack. Informal possessors of the planners had lacked both the numbers and the tactical know how to seriously threaten the larger settlements. Maroons were often organized into small companies, each with guns, which acted as an independent raiding parties or were able to launch pencil movement against the enemy. One camp contained over 30 guns, giving the Maroons a formidable volume of firepower. Assaults on a Maroon position, even by regular troops, evidence in intel, uh, intel risk. In one such attack in 1786, four soldiers were wounded, and the Negroes came down in such numbers that it judged advisable to retire to their boats, from which the Negroes, Negroes attempted to cut them off. A complete route was only inverted by a discharge of a field artillery piece located loaded with grape shot, which wounded many of the Maroons. Maroon leaders eventually gave themselves military titles such as captain or general. One Maroon in the 1780s called himself Captain Cujo, an imitation of the famous Jamaican Maroon leader of the 1730s. The internal leadership dispute can occur over the shared plunder and concerning raid policy. But unity of purpose was the critical to the long-term survival of Maroon communities. Only by working together for the collective good could Maroons hold themselves to attain food to live and have a chance of defending themselves against attack. Maroon societies were often heavily masculine in comparison to the other African and African American communities in North America. Man constitutes about 80 percent of the runaway fugitives of plantations. According to the several study of runaway advisements in the newspaper, they tend to be predominantly among the Maroons. The relatively small number of women who joined or were forced Maroon groups undertook specific roles in the community. They included planting rice and vegetable, specifically clearing spaces and caring for their children. No woman took part in the raids or were being reported as being armed. Such activities were exclusively male. There were occasional reports to have children living among the room, room, room rooms, but they skewed the gender ratio and lived short nature in short-lived nature, nature of the maroon communities, resulting in limited opportunities for family formations. Maroons were therefore more likely to reside in homosocial groups than those who remained enslaved, with the emphasis on communal and collective violence and the absence of a family that might curb such tendencies. Hmm. Let me read this again. The Maroons were therefore more likely to reside in homosocial groups than those who remained enslaved, with the emphasis on communal and collective violence and the absence of family that might curb such tendencies. Though, to those that remain enslaved, we might anticipate the Maroons became heroic, perhaps even mythical figures. Maroons who stuck and struck against the planet authority and the power was quite possibly fulfilling the secret desires of the oppressed. While the overt resistance could spell summary execution for the slaves, the individual runaway faced tremendous difficulties and escapes. Maroons had the capacity to fight back. In 1786, two white men of Christ Church Parish came upon a camp of runaway Negroes and captured two of them. However, Within hours, the rest of the Maroon gang, apparently numbering more than 20, ambushed the men, shooting one of them dead. In such direct refutations and the notion of the black cowardness, in such direct refutation to the notice of black cowardness and inferiority, the rules offer a symbolic and actual threat to slavery and white mastery. It was conceivable that to inspire others. Some masters certainly believed that the Maroon community attracted the front with the slaves across the plantation. The hunters were often provided with information to help them avoid white hunting parties. Charles Menigo, the owner of the Silk Hope Plantation on Cooper River near Charleston, 
I mean, that no overseer or planter should speak on such objects, even for a small houseboy or girl, as they communicate all that they hear to others, and who can bear to despise other runaway who are still at home. Such corroboration and protective networks of solidarity support assertions by historians that the enslaved could share a code of honor with fugitives and fighting maroons, showing their respect for one another by hiding and feeding runaways and refusing to betray other bondsmen. Yet the existing sources secretly failed to suggest that the maroons were actively assisted by plantation slaves on a regular basis. To the contrary, they highlighted the constant tensions and negotiations that remarks interaction between the two groups. Maroons were forced to engage with plantation communities no maroon settlement was entirely self-sufficient, but it was clear that the plantation terrain could become a battlefield. For maroon communities, neighbor plantations were a vital source of corn, beef, bacon, and other supplies such as tools, guns, powder, and ammunition. In fact, the evidence points to the maroons regularly entering plantations to gain any supplies. These visits were often characterized as raids, like the one on Mr. Walmart's plantation, which was ordered to remove every valuable possession, every valuable he possessed. Of course, it is possible the slave force were unwilling to countenance the complicity of their slaves in the system of rooms. But the enslaved may have their own reason for resenting these kinds of encroachments and shares of their owner's opinions of them, particularly considering that the communal aspects of maroonage kindly made the thieves more materialistic significant than those of individual slaves, individual runaways. Furthermore, the militaristic nature of the incursion could place members of the raided community in very real dangers. The Maroons took what they wanted or needed, even though they may have adversely affected the population of slaves. If Maroons put the enslaved community in danger or at risk of punishment, rather than receiving food supplies from the plantation, plantation population, it was far more likely that they would be betrayed. On an occasion, slaves assisted whites in capturing Maroons. In a more desperate, violent, and notorious Maroon of the Maroon, the more likely of seeing other slaves aided in their capture. So the more the, the more the Maroon was a bad guy, the more the slaves would come and help out. They were bringing more slaves to help out. They um cool brigade. Let's see. In February 1820, a young white man. Thomas Dessaline was killed on the Spoiler Plantation in Dewey Island, North of Charleston, by a party of runaway Negroes. Some Maroons were apprehended at the scene, but Alberto, the one who shot Dessaline in the face, escaped. Apparently unconcerned about the loyalty of his slaves, Dessaline's father armed his Negroes and sent him in pursuit of the murderous gangs. But Alberto had swam from the island back to the mainland and attempted to secure himself and one that Mr. Hyburn house Negroes, Negro houses. It was left to Holland and slave driver to kindly affect their both capture. The driver occupied the contentious positions of powder, of power, and that could be used or abused to protect other slaves. And T.J. Jess O.B. notes that the status of the master culture was not always enough to override steadfastness with the rebellious or the resistant slaves. However, this instance, the driver had no qualms about apprehending a dangerous individual and handing him over to whites, even though the fugitive fate will be certain. Mm. Sometimes slaves have been forced to help their master pursue runaways. Planters hunting maroons on the PD River in 1826 took with them seven trusted Negroes, who presumably were similar, familiar with the river and swamps and could act like guys. Why these slaves had no choice but to do as their master instructed. Those sympathetic with the Maroons could have delayed the search or deliberately led their masters from away from a known camp. In this case, though a camp was discovered, but the Maroons escaped into the impenetrable swamp. Planet threats could be enough to persuade slaves to betray the notions of the Maroons and avoid being beaten themselves, but it's also apparent that some slaves actively desired to integrate themselves with whites. It was most likely the prospect of financial war that led two slaves. Tom and Jack to brave every hazard in order to bring about the apprehension of one of the gang's lawless and desperate runaways near Georgetown. The captured man was later tried and executed while Tom and Jack received $50 from the South Carolina legislature. Legislation. 
it is possible to attempt to, to, to buy some of these slaves to betray Maroons, and the actions of the Maroons themselves could be sufficient to alienate other slaves. Due to their militaristic structure, Maroon communities are more capable than individual runaways of them making daring iron braids on plantations, and these definitely led to the risk of injury to the slaves. The use of buckshot meant that even a well-aimed blast from a firearm could accidentally maim or even kill an innocent slave nearby, an innocent slave nearby. And sometimes lethal violence could be used quite deliberately. Shared oppression was not sufficient to spare from room from maroon violence. In November 1812, travelers to St. Anne Parish, just outside of Charleston, were continually being robbed by a gang of armed runaway Negroes. Among their victims were several Negroes who were stopped and money and clothes taken from them and their persons kept in custody until the night. Targeting slaves was an obvious venue, avenue whereby Maroons could lose support and were, who were those who remained enslaved. When Maroons near Wilmington, North Carolina, were reportedly to be frequently robbing slaves and threatened to penetrate and do more atrocious crimes, it didn't take long before people of their own color informed against them. A white posse slowly captured all those Maroons as a direct result of information about the slaves. In addition, some slaves might have resented the excursion by Maroons on plantation, especially when they stole food. Any loss of provisions meant there was less food to be distributed among the slaves. And where the master lost significant sums through depredations of maroons, and they had tried to recruit their losses by cutting in lines of clowns of food and clothing to the enslaved population. Forcible kidnapping significantly affected the attitude of the plantation towards the slaves towards maroon. One source, one such horse slave, Duran, testified to have a chance to come on a road, resulting him being forced to join a maroon gang. The maroon leader, Ben, told Duran he must go with them and not go home as he feared he'd be permitted to return when he get the information that he had seen him, which would prevent him from being away with his wife and children on the mistress plantation. Theron spent some months living as a maroon, raiding plantations for cattle and other necessities, and all the while planning to be afraid to flee, as Negro Ben had sometimes shot a fellow man court for saying he wanted to go home. Eventually, however, the opportunity to take a boat and escape arose and Theron went back to his home plantation. Signifying one example where personal and communal ties were more important than the relative freedom offered by Maroonage. <clears throat> While Theron's story of inter-slavery conflict could have been a self-serving testimony of an otherwise implicated individual, his experience was collaborated by another slave named John. John declared that Ben threatened to kill every Negro who refused to join him. This aggressive stance toward plantation slaves was clearly counterproductive. Bill failed to gather support of local slaves who perceived him as a threat rather than a figure to be lauded. Ultimately, the information provided by John and Theron was extremely helpful to white planters who used it to locate and destroy Ben's maroon camp. Slaves who helped whites capture and kill maroons were regarded as self-seeking, but they also have, may have had a defending in a particular sense of community. While individual runaways were forced to negotiate more happily across nearer boundaries and aggressive nature of the maroonage, now the aggressive nature of maroonage complicated the politics of solidarity among the enslaved in a direct manner. Runaways could surely be threatened to coerce help from other states at times, but maroonage was able to produce a systematic violence. Hmm where the Maroons acted violently against those who left the plantation and by injuring or kidnapping them during raids, slaves had vested interest in protecting themselves and their families from harms. These Maroons had in fact gone rogue, failing to discriminate from those who had been responsible for their oppression, the white planter, and those who had shared it, the slaves. To the Maroon, plantations were a treasure troves of supplies to be plundered as required. Regardless of who suffered as, as a result, the story of one maroon leader in South Carolina gave further insight on how the plantation slave perceived and interacted with maroons. Two maroons had such an extended career as Joe, physically imposing in a famous life, very style not better men, at least six feet high. Joe's body bore testament to his violent lifestyle, with a scar on one of his cheeks to believe his right, 
an occasion of a bite of a nigger on the fight, and a scar from a cut saber, cut of a saber, the believed to be on his right arm, and shot marks in both his legs. Although he appears to be first in written records in May 1821, Joe might have been a group of runaways hunted in the Asante River swamps near Pineville in the summer of 1819, since this is the close where he eventually would be killed at in 1823. If Joe was a leading maroon gang who in enormous swamps and adjacent to the Shanti River as early as 1819, as it did in the manner that the first did not attract much attention from the local whites. All that changed on a night of Sunday, May 27, 1821. Joe, together with two accomplices, landed on the plantation of George Ford on the southern island of near Georgetown with the attention of stealing cattle. Ford was alerted to their presence and went to investigate. He had barely set out when he was shot and killed by the Maroons. The gun had been loaded with a slug and ball, and the use of a projectile obviously increased the chance of hitting the target. Unfortunately for Ford, the, part, the principal part of the slug entered his head and the ball penetrated his breast, killing him instantly. It was not just Ford who was injured on the, by the raiding Maroons, as two or four slaves were also hit by gunshots. One of them squarely in the temple and in the groin. And perhaps as a consequence of violence which perpetrated against the blacks, that other another four slaves concealed themselves behind the ox that it had been killed in hope of the turns and not the removal. When this indeed happened, one of the maroons were captured. Another maroon was de detailed by the militia for four days, but Joe escaped into the south of the swamps, born in the Sanity. The Sanity swamps stretch from the Atlantic Ocean nearly to Columbia, more than 250 miles, 50 miles, and Joe evidently knew them well. So Joe knew the swamp well and everything around Columbia. His old camp was a large swamp at the confluence of the Watergee and the Cachete Rivers, which formed the Sancti below the Columbia, close to his original Richland County plantation. He was variously mentioned as hiding in the swamps in Lancaster, Charleston, Georgetown districts, which all bordered the Shanati or Watery Rivers. After the murder, Joe immediately thought it was to head, head inland or from the coast, where George Ford Plantation was located, and the hunt for him was most immense, and the find refuge in the Georgetown district swamps until the search died down. At several points during the manhunt, Joe came in contact with the plantation slaves. In occasion, he received food, and most importantly, information. Papers reported that he had been several times driven in such a situation and had supported the strongest hopes of being taken. But the intelligence and the support furnished him from some of the neighboring plantations had thoroughly assisted to elude his pursuers. It is not known whether the intelligence support were given voluntarily or extorted, but at least on one occasion, Joe forced a free black woman at gunpoint to give her a considerable amount of bacon, corn, and ammunition. Hopes of capturing Joe slowly faded and eventually made his way inland, where he resumed his life of raiding plantation for supplies and recruits. On one such raid, Dr. Louis Real Plantation in the Sumter District, Joe sees an apparently unwanted woman, woman for his wife. Some months later, a slave of Colonel J.B. Richardson was instrumental in rescuing this woman and returning her to Raul. But in revenge for this act, Joe led a five man arm, arm raid on a Richardson plantation, seeing out the slave as he worked in the fields and killed him. He just rolled up on him like, you know, Frank Lucas. <laughs> you know, shot him in the, middle of the, in the middle of the plantation like he didn't give it down. Such a dare raid in broad daylight in front of the overseer was a strong sign of the other slaves that Joe had no fear of white authority and was willing and able to inflict violence on the slaves that crossed him, regardless of their mass protection. Joe, well-organized and heavily armed gang, was able to act with impunity, striking whenever and whenever they choose. A few plantations would have a significant armed white man at the ready to mount a effective resistance. As if to prove his preeminence, Joe later returned to Raul Plantation and took the rescued woman away again. Mm. Joe's relationship with the enslaved was therefore somewhat Unitarian. Those who provided food and ammunition and information, whether were voluntary or coerced, were very useful, and this was doubtful that Joe could be survived so long about, as a maroon without their help. 
Furthermore, his violence and theft did not deter everyone. New went away, all men in his band ensured that he would remain a former post, of course. Even after the capture and execution of certain gang members, where Joe met resistance, he responded with violence and little regard for the wishes of other slaves. Women were taken by force, and those that opposed him accept little mercy. Richards and slaves have been long threatened for his actions in rescuing the woman from Joe's camp, demonstrating that his killing was a no heat of the moment response, but rather a cold, calculated act of revenge. The kidnapping of individuals and in brutal acts against the perceived enemies, white and black, were highly intended to endear Joe to those who were made enslaved. For more than two years after the death of George Ford, Joe continued his bandit lifestyle with white seemingly powerless to stop him. In the summer of 1821, local militia units spent time trying to capture Joe, and their papers were full of his praise for spirit and atrocity invented by different military corps and their labors and undefeatable, undefeatable pursuit and which entitled them to the highest commendation. Some militia forces have been day and night occupying and scourging the woods and the swamps to the distance of 20, 30 miles from town, not percent the stream heat and the weather and the heavy showers which they had been exposed to. In spite of this assertion, Joe remained at large. In January 18, excuse me, in July 1821, the Charleston Times commented, the subtle African continued his lodgment in the borders of the swamps and prowls around the neighborhood settlements in defiance of all that made a, a attempt to apprehend him. Joe was definitely the master of his environment. At one point, the newspaper reported that he was trapped on a peninsula or a narrow strip of swamp, bounded by the sanity on one side and a lake which unites with the river on the other. But there was at one point in which he could escape by land and that we understand is closely guarded. A few days later, however, it was announced that Joe had escaped the business of the pursuers in this neighborhood. By early autumn 1823, local newspapers disappeared and more than two years had elapsed since the murder of George Ford. Yet Joe was still on the loose. The editors were aware that he was the most dense in an impervious swamp and places himself at the head of the little fugitive slaves in arms themselves, which eliminated the fact that this accomplished villain had been pursuing his course of plunder with the most tranquil and interrupted manner. The Charleston newspaper had little clue as to how to catch him. Although one group of citizens in Pikeville, which was located along the Tennessee River in the extreme north of Charleston district, formed the Pikeville Police Association on October 2nd, 1823, specifically to devise a plan to apprehend Joe or Forrest as he being called at the time. Joe was now encamped in the vicinity of the Ashanti Canal, and his gang of desperate runaways had committed many trepidations in the neighborhood and elsewhere. Local rights were conscious of the maroon camps, were sheltered by difficult approaches, and the maroons were strengthened by firearms and other weapons of offense. Confidence in their secure location, the maroons threatened the lives of many individuals and carried on unmolested system of open violence and robberies. Joe's interpretation had not been confined to whites. The planners had hoped to split the possible division between Maroons and those who remained in the slave to their advantage. One planner, William Du Bois, but uh, by secret orders of reward to certain Negroes, their agency and assistance might be as far as obtained, as able to a party of judiciously post as a surprise and take them. The members of the Pikeville Police Association agreed to the plan suggesting they was unreasonably calm that they can find a slave willing to betray Joe. And in this, they were correct. A slave named Billy, owner Austin Perry, provided an active and a ready a cooperation in the plan of capturing Joe. But the events in the meantime rendered Billy help superfluous since Joe was killed on October 4th. When a Pikeville Police Association met again on October 5th, Billy was paid $47 because he always believed that what the circumstances not within the control of either party, police assess must have been perfect on their designs. This fellow had fulfilled with infidelity the duties imposed upon him and when endangered his life in the execution of him. It is unclear why Billy cooperated with the boys, though the financial insistence was financial. Whether his motivation, Billy Evan had little sympathy and solidarity for Joe and other Maroons who were willing to work 
with whites despite the possible threat of reprisals. Joe Demise was affected by the party of 23 men who came from the Sanity River in the Condon district. While a contemporary news here made no mention of the involvement of a slave named Rail in luring Joe to this from the swamp refuge, other sources indicate that he played a pivotal role. Warren was a patroon commanding a vessel, a trading vessel that piled in a river. With considerable judgment and address, he split minutes to lure Joe and three of his followers from their swamp hideouts to offer trade. In reality, Royal enticed the Maroons into an ambush of armed white men who immediately shot and killed Joe and his three pants. In 1824, 81 planters from Central South Carolina petitioned the state legislature to remunerate Royal and consequently for his fidelity and good conduct and making himself an immediate instrument and in bringing towards merit of punishment of an offender against the laws of the land and against the laws of God, of the worst character and of the highest gravitivity. The state agreed to pay the owner $700 for his freedom. Mm. The legislature declared that it was the policy of the state to reward those slaves who thus distinguished themselves by a way of inducement to others to do likewise. This is what Dr. Claude Anderson was talking about with um, Manny Mears, with Mission Manny Mears, you know what I'm saying? So they free to do that set up Joe from South Carolina, the Maroon leader. It is doubtful that the whites have been able to catch Joe without Black's help. Joe Games reported completely under his direction. And he obviously was a care managed leader. Even whites acknowledged that he had the art and address to aspire followers with the most wildest and dangerous enthusiasm. The runaways who joined Joe, fiercely loyal, suggesting they were un un unlikely to betray him even if captured. The Maroons and the aid of firearms, so a direct assault on Joe Kent was dangerous. Indeed, one white man was wounded by a buckshot during the hunt for Joe Gang. Whites were also mindful that Joe had under control whatever boats he navigated the section of the river. Most of those undertaking the transport of goods of the shiny were slaves. And Joe used the threats and persuasion to attain information at every moment made a plan device to catch him. Furthermore, his intimacy and influence over other Negroes in the neighborhood of his encampment rendered every other attempt that he made to back him up either abortive. Those who did not aid him were treated as enemies. Every individual who manifested a disposition to check him in his career of violence or assist him in his apprehension became objects of his vengeance. By surrounding himself with those who were loyal and could be relied upon and got him on other data accurate intelligence through threats and persuasion, Joe was able to act with impunity, meaning some of the most daring outrage and the open defiance of laws. With his strategy evidently working and emboldened by his success, Joe plunged deeper and deeper into crime until neither fear nor danger could deter him first from threatening and then executing a train of misfits who we believe quite without peril in this country. If Joe Bandery was enough to stir white slaveholders into action, his rumored dissemination of notions among blacks calculated the end of a productive insubordination insurrections within the hideous trains of evil that usually follow. Capel didn't take his threats seriously. It should be remembered that Denmark Vesey's pilot occurred in South Carolina while Joe was still at large. So Denmark Vesey got popped off while Joe was still doing this. Planners from St. John's and Berkeley and St. Stephen Parishes, as well as Sumter and Richland districts, organized themselves in the company and scored Sati River Swamp from the confluence of the two rivers that formed the Murray Ferry, a distance by land of 60 miles, but weighed down by excessive fatigue and rendered dispirited by the members of the stint of the end of character of their places of retreat and concealment. There was a point of giving up when Well offered his service. Well took for her considerable personal risk collaborating with whites since they can easily face reprisal from those who support Joe's mandatory. In so much as the written record was silent on Royal's motivation for helping the slaveholders kill Joe, we are forced to speculate why he actively sought to end Joe's career on a sign of team. Perhaps the most straightforward reason that presented itself relates really to Joe Royal's employment. As a patron, Royal transported goods on the Sinai River. 
and Joe's activities, according to the local planners at least, disrupted traffic. Being a pontoon was a privileged position, necessary involving an unusual degree of freedom of movement. Pontoons could be away from their plantations for lengthy periods and rarely had to endure close white supervision. It was also common for the slave boatmen to conduct business on their own. The Georgetown District River Grand Jury complained about the practice of Negroes navigating the rivers and creeks and flats and boats for cutting woods and other purposes, and this way carrying on traffic with the Negroes of neighboring plantation. So interference could have well reduced royal inability to make a personal profit. While this precedent for his violent actions may have rostered fear and suspicions, Joe's reputation for aggressive with those who opposed him was well known, and thus any move against him will need to be decisive. Otherwise, it will only increase the, or increase the risk of revenge of attack. Joining forces with armed whites made assault more likely to deceive. While well may have hoped for a monetary award or manumission, he eventually received records suggest that he volunteered his hope freely it was not responding with neither offer or reward or a report by the whites. Without royal assistance, local planners were convinced they would have been unable to lure Joe out of his camp and ambush him. In order for the ambush to work, Joe needed to trust Royal and making it likely that the two had met previously, making it likely that the two had met previously. It is possible that Royal was those with whom Joe had coerced or threatened or persuaded to provide information on what the local planners were planning. Joe's own security measure, in a sense, helped bring about his downfall, since he assumed he was dealing with only a fellow black and he was safe from attack. Despite his ill treatment of slaves, it seems that Joe thought that no black would betray him. Royal, however, was one slave who did not feel any sense of racial solidarity with a dangerous maroon. Hmm. It is evident that the communal bonds amongst Black South Carolinas were flexible and transcendent issues of race and shared oppression. Solidarity was negotiable among the enslaved, and terms could differ dramatically. Multiple Black communities overlapped South Carolina before 1865, and the Maroons operated across the plantation borders, while drawn from the same Black population as the slave community. They existed free of white control in a state of semi-permanent warfare. In order to maintain their independence, they took supplies and recruited from plantation, negotiated with some slaves, and violently repressed others. For Maroons, the damage this did to the plantation economies, and therefore the slaves residing on the plantation, was secondary to their survival of their own community. Slave communities have been broadly sympathetic to the courage and example set by Maroons. But individuals that consisted of these communities had to make their own personal choices to ensure the Maroons did not cause harm to themselves or those they cared for. Slaves and Maroons certainly could interact harmoniously with the report of extensive traffic between two groups on a walk of the streets of Georgetown. Once raids in plantation, once raids on plantation began to impact the slave community negatively, however, support for the Maroons waned and some actively assisted whites in their attempt to recapture or destroy the Maroon communities. Maroons may have offered a heroic vision of black resistance, striking back against white oppression, but few states were willing to see their own meager living standards fall as a resort. That's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. That, you know, that's the same situation that really go on with black people today now. You know what I'm saying? The fat belly makes the decision for the, those that want freedom. You know what I'm saying? I can't live like this. I'm, saying, I'm not going to give up this job. What the fuck? I'm making more than all y'all. You know what I'm saying? You know it's called a harm to the community. The story of the South Carolina Maroons enforces the argument that historians lumped all Black people together upon their peril. Multiple Black communities exist in South Carolina. Urban, rural, rice producing, crime producing, domestic, field, slave, free. And all those we should add, Maroon. The negotiation of violence and betrayal that Mark Maroon's and Plantation's relationship highlight the further complicity of the interaction among the enslaved. Although it clearly established that, that the enslaved developed strategic strategies for survival within the confines of their bondage, it is worth emphasizing that no two strategies were the same, and some directly clashed with each other. 
There were slaves who carried ferry with their masters to win indulgence, while others exploited loopholes in the system to trade stolen goods. Some run away, and some numbers choose to resist with violence. While Black South Carolinians were almost certainly shared a distrust and dislike of white control, maroon communities asserted power and influence over the enslaved, and their survival demanded a willingness to lash out. This violence can threaten Blacks as much as white in the politicity of solidarity. Maroons are not simply outsiders, but sometimes active threats. And there you have it. Um, that's one of the stories about the Maroon communities in um, South Carolina. That's a good story about Joe, you know what I'm saying? That we found out he had a, you know, he was surviving. Just like cats out here, they surviving. It's, you know, Joe's story is still kind of the story of Joe, the Maroon in South Carolina during this time, during the 18, early 1820s. It's kind of replicable still today, how things is going on. You know what I'm saying? But as you see, there's not kind of a racist out there. Like I said, hey, I'm going to do my good ass job. So you can keep on doing what you're doing. Because it's hurting me in the long run, it's hurting my status. Same stuff that kind of goes on today. You know what I'm saying? But um, that was it. I know it's kind of long, but that was good. You know, South Carolina, Maroonage. Got one in the Dismal Swamp. I think I got one almost every 50, almost every state in the South. You know what I'm saying? About Maroon communities. That's not really talked about. And there was bigger ones than just the ones in the Dismal Swamp. You got to go down to Florida. You know, like you said, Alabama. Definitely Louisiana. Kentucky had a couple. You know what I mean? So, we got to um, focus up on our history. You know what I'm saying? So subscribe to the channel. This is Kosky of Funny. Hit the like button. You know, peace. Thank you for listening and watching. Peace.